Okay. My name is Marshal Lassman. Uh, I uh, prepared to talk about the paper, which I assume everyone at least looked at if they read. And I thought I was going to put it in context. In a way, that's what uh, Johan had done. Uh, also, there's a disconnect not to relate at all to what he said. So maybe I'll say a few words about the presentation, and then I'll get into the paper. Uh, with regard to Sefer HaCheshek, which uh, Yochanan introduced me to in 1995, this is part of a genre of Sefer Sgulot, uh, books that talk about what a Baal Shem knows or does, uh, what uh, incantation to say when, uh, how to mix your potion, what ingredients to put in, etc., uh, etc. Et and this particular book, first of all, the, the, the Cheshek part, I believe, comes from Psalm 91, Yosheh uh, Seter al which is a, an important Kabbalistic text, and has the verse in it, Ki vi chashak v'afalteu asagveu ki adashmi, because he... Uh, desired me, I will bring him salvation. I will uh, raise him up. Uh, in other words, somebody who writes Sefer HaCheshek is showing how much he, uh, the depth of his feeling for God. And that's why you have all these books, I think, uh, called Sefer HaCheshek, based on this pasuk and, and referring to the psalm, which is, as I said, an important Kabbalistic text in itself. Uh, Hillel Baal Shem had a problem. He keeps hinting over and over again that there's an exorcism that he did that went wrong and the patient died. Uh, he doesn't come out and describe it, but it's clear that something went wrong, somebody died, he was held responsible, and now he's trying to uh, re regain his reputation. So that's one problem. The other problem is what Yochanan referred to with these popular books that are being published, especially in uh, Zhokiev, uh, where uh, it's like a cookbook approach to uh, practical Kabbalah. You read the book and you know what to do. So just as uh, halachists objected to the Shulchan Aruch in the 16th century as a cookbook approach to halakha uh, codification, so uh, this genuine Baal Shem is objecting to uh, the cookbook approach to practical Kabbalah. And what he really wanted was to get what the Baal Shem Tov got, and that is a permanent position as the Baal Shem of some town. So what he did was to write this book to show what he knows, to show his bona fides to the Balabatim of whatever town he would go to, and, and to explain that if you've heard that I killed somebody, well, there's, there's an explanation for it. And, uh, and s compared to these popular books, you see everything I have to offer. Okay. Yes? But uh, the fact that uh, somebody dies it does not mean that it was a bad writing to basically... Well, that's what, that's what he that says. says. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is something that we need... Uh, Fine, that's, that's his claim. Is, but uh, you can imagine... Whether the patient dies or not, this, uh, Okay. As I say, we don't have a description. We don't know exactly what happened. It's, he just hints at it, but he obviously feels very guilty because he keeps hinting about it. Right. So, uh, you, you know, I don't know what happened, but he obviously would have said just what you said now. He has a very Catholic understanding of the case. Now, also in the break, I was asked to talk about uh, that what you're really interested in is the... Uh, relationship between the Baal Shem Tov and uh, uh, Slavic religion. And of course, that's a question that's been on the agenda since the 1930s, if not before, uh, with Isander beginning a famous or infamous article of Yafa Eliyaf, which I've talked about elsewhere. Um, and then Turov, who I don't think succeeded any more than anybody before him. Um, what you, you do see in uh, Sefer HaCheshek, uh, which Yochanan alluded to at least, 
uh, is that he uses the non-Jewish date, he uses all sorts of uh, Polish words, technical terms. Uh, he obviously is familiar with uh, uh, non-Jewish medical practices. Um, so there is some kind of dialogue going on, but I can't really go beyond that. Uh, I know that disappoints you. <laughs> but, uh, where all the people who have tried to show the, uh, and they, they use the word, I don't like the word, influence of uh, Slavic religion uh, on the Baal Shem Tov or on Baal Shem in general, nobody has yet succeeded to show the direct connection. Uh, perhaps if you start with Sefer HaCheshek, you'll get to some of the nuts and bolts of a connection. Um, but that doesn't get you to the Baal Shem Tov. And I doubt, frankly, that you're going to get to the Baal Shem Tov because he didn't write anything. So, okay, now I'd like to get but to what... You can get acquainted with the practices. Uh, well, that's why I say, uh, so then not, look... Not, not through reading, but through... Well, we, we, I know from, uh, from Yiddish literature, and it's mm -hmm. in Tobos, I mean, it uh, recurs all the time, that uh, practitioners of... Uh, uh, Healing, both Jewish and non-Jewish, were present with the same patient in the same room. I mean, if somebody had trouble, I mean, his wife, well, to not give birth, or she had a difficult childbirth. Child delivery. Delivery, yes. delivery thank you. They will be present in the same room, yes. both about him, and, uh, and there's Nachor or a Tutan. Yes. A, a, Tatar woman, not be Well, the Jewish and Gentile doctor, sometimes they were obliged to by their contact. Yes, okay. But the Yes, I'm speaking about acquaintance that does not come necessarily through reading. So the question about reading. No, but I was just referring to the Baal Shem Everybody wants to know. Like I say, I think if you start with say for a, this Not say for a Cheshek, pagan, you'll find, pagan sources, you will pagan find sources. yes, you'll find uh, everything you're looking for, but it's not going to le <laughs> lead you directly <laughs> to the Baal Shem Tov, which is what everybody is interested in. Anyway, but what I really planned to talk about was what I see as the context for Yochanan's paper, and that is not too long ago. And, in too distant academic past. It was customary to talk in terms of an autonomous, authentic Jewish culture, and that Jewish communities all over the world were cells of this authentic, autonomous Jewish culture. And these cells were in dialogue, and I put that in quotation marks because it's used all the time as a really technical term, in dialogue with the host society or surrounding society. And this dialogue uh, resulted in a kind of influence. It could be good influence. Good influence is called acculturation. So the famous example is Hashmonaim, uh, uh, the Hasmoneans uh, took all sorts of Hellenistic customs and Judaize them. So just the idea of a holiday of Hanukkah to celebrate your uh, victory, this is a Hellenistic custom, but what came out of it was what eventually became a very significant Jewish holiday. So that's acculturation. Bad uh, result of the dialogue is what's called assimilation. That is, uh, that the, Jew, the authentic Jewish culture is diluted. And the standard example of assimilation is Salon Jewesses uh, at the late 18th and early 19th century in Germany who uh, engaged with Christians in all sorts of social and cultural settings. This led to mixed marriage, conversion. So that's assimilation. So it's good influence and bad influence. Okay, that was then. In the last generation, 
academic research has made it appear that virtually all aspects of Jewish culture were shaped to begin with by the encounter, and that's another word we can put in quotation marks, uh, between the surrounding stronger cultures. So Jewish ideas, Jewish institutions, Jewish rituals were all at base reactions to reflections of derivative from uh, the people with whom Jews were in close contact. So medieval Jewish philosophy, well, that's just another version of neo-Aristotelianism or neo-Platonism. Um, piyut, medieval Jewish religious poetry, that's a calc on Christian medieval religious poetry. Uh, Jewish Bible commentary, that's based on uh, Muslim templates. Um, Jewish autonomy institutions, well, just look at the standard organization of any medieval city in Europe, and uh, those are the models, Jewish autonomy. Etc. Etc. So we go from a an authentic Jewish culture in dialogue to a Jewish culture that is uh, embedded within a non-Jewish culture and indebted to that culture, uh, culturally speaking. So the metaphor went from cultural dialogue to cultural hybridity. And hybridity means that Jewish culture is not in dialogue. It is a subset of the hegemonic culture, the culture of the majority, and it is a skewed duplication of that culture. So Jews who live in Arab lands are Arab Jews. Uh, Portuguese Jews are, form a kind, a kind of Portuguese nation. A uh, famous chapter written by Gershon Hundert in his first book, Jews and Other Poles. So there is no common Jewish history. There are Jewish histories because in every place the Jews are a hybrid with whatever uh, the majority happens to be. And so as David Ruderman put it, uh, these Jewish histories are radically singular, diverse, heterogeneous, lacking common features that might link them together. So we went from dialogue to hybridity. Now I think that while these two models both exist, there are other models. It's not either this or that. Both of them exist and there are other models uh, which we might say are in between. There are multiple models of Jewish, non-Jewish cultural exchange. So to give you a couple examples, we have the model of unintended consequences. What do I mean? Let's take residential restrictions. When non-Jewish authorities restrict the residence of Jews in various ways, there are all sorts of ways, as you know, that could be restricted. Uh, Often the consequence of this was to create a space where an autonomous Jewish culture could grow up. Uh, to give a space for the Jews to nurture their institutions and their cultural, their, their cultural trends, which may be hybrid in part with the surrounding culture, but they can also be hybrid with other things. They can be hybrid with Jewish history. They can be hybrid vertically with Jewish tradition, and they can be hybrid horizontally with other Jewish communities. So hybridity is not just limited to the people that you are closest to. Um, or take the 19th century uh, Russian law pro uh, prohibiting Hasidic rebbe's in Ukraine to travel. They had to stay in their place. Well, what was the unintended consequence of this? That they created these tremendous courts that were important centers and everybody came to them and this created a certain style of Hasidism that was very significant. Or take another example, uh, what we might call the ecological model. That is, again, looking at 19th century Hasidism, 
I think that's past the chronological limit of this group, but okay. Um, where do you find the important rebbe's in shtetls? That is, the the, uh, the court is in a shtetl. It's not in a village, and it's not in a city. Why the shtetl? Well, I think because in a small town, first of all, you have a critical mass of Jews. There is a Jewish community, but it's not a very heterogeneous one as you might have in the city. So that it's relatively easy for the tzaddik to uh, become the dominant force in this community and also to control the borders between the Jewish community and the Christian community so that you have them moving to these small towns, establishing their uh, very powerful court, which in many places is the most important institution in the town, Jewish or not Jewish, and then adapting Ukrainian or Polish dances, uh, folk songs, which we might call insularity through acculturation. That is, uh, this is obviously a kind of acculturation, but it, it is being used to promote the insularity of the group and to erect borders with the non-Jews. Now, Yochanan showed us a few things about sharing and discussed how it's important to look at Jewish, non-Jewish cultural exchange in non-hierarchical terms. Well, this is what I've called a shared band of culture, and that's another model, the shared band of culture. And he talked about uh, the Paracelsian medicine as a part of the shared band of culture, one of the uh, threads on that band. There are many threads on the shared band of culture. Gender roles, uh, what is considered proper behavior for men and women, uh, are to a large extent shared. Or economic theory, uh, the idea talking period, and he was talking about the early modern period, that competition within your group is bad, competition with other groups is okay. Well, that's, everybody believes in it, whether you're Jewish or Christian or whatever. Or political theory, the idea that uh, leaders don't represent the people they are uh, the guardians of the people. They take care of the people. Well, everybody believes in that. Um, and then, of course, uh, he believes in demons. And just like everybody in this room believes that the room is full of waves, and that if you turn on your phone, the waves will come to it, or you turn on the radio, other waves will come to it, or you turn on whatever it is, there's a wave for everything. Even though we don't see the waves, we can't touch the waves, we believe they're there. Well, they believed the room was full of demons. And everybody believed that. Didn't matter what you were. So this, all of these things are part of what I call the shared band of culture. And I think Yochanan's paper is a great example of this shared band of culture with uh, the, the pharmacy and everything that he talks about leading up to it and the Paracelsian medicine principles. Uh, everybody believes in these principles. Everybody believes that this is the way you approach things, except, as he points out, things are in transition. And so here's where I'd like to talk about the paper itself. Um, so the paper shows that there are shared beliefs about the body, about medicine, about healing. It's common to everyone. Uh, that Paracelsian modes of treatment are common to everyone. And what I think is important is to emphasize that, it, yes, they do borrow from each other. You see that what looked like Jewish practices show up with the Christians and vice versa, but that's not the, the point. The point is that they're all cultivating uh, Paracelsian-based medicine uh, based on what they, they believe. That's the point. And so if cultivating includes this borrowing, that's just one aspect of it. Also, I think that he gives us a great uh, material culture description of the medicines 
and the pharmacy. And this description can help us understand at least certain Jewish texts, uh, which without knowing the technical terms would be very difficult for us to understand. I do have some questions. First of all, this business about Jewish pharmacists. Uh, if you look at the taxpayer lists in various towns, one of the most common names is Aptekaj. I know in Menzibuj there was somebody named Hirsch Aptekaj in the 1740s who actually was a rabbi. So I don't know, I always wonder where, where the Aptekaj name came from. Uh, but he's certainly not the only one. You, lots of people, you should have this Daniel Aptekaj. There's lots of people named Aptekaj. What does that mean if uh, there are only non Jewish uh, pharmacies and uh, pharmacists? Reich. Um, <laughs> another question I have is chronology. From the paper, you could it make it sound, sound seem like the transition to uh, modern doctors happened either in the beginning of the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century, or in the early 19th century. It's not clear to me when this transition takes place. Uh, also, you make it sound like the transition is very abrupt. I see it as something, uh, there's a transitional phase uh, you said that the Baal Shem Tov and Shif Chayabesh show scorn for doctors. I would say the story shown competing with doctors. And what, what you have, it seems to me, is a, a period in which uh, the Baal Shem and the doctors are, uh, coexist. And uh, actually, Hillel Baal Shem has great respect for doctors. And he says you can blend the... Uh, Baal Shem method and the doctor method and he he works together. Him. Yes, he studies with doctors. Uh, whereas we get to the early 19th century with Sheikh Mehabesh, which is uh, it's already uh, 70 years after Hillel Baal Shem, and there the stories reflect uh, competition between Baal Shem and the doctor. So uh, what is the model of the, of the transition from Balshemiut and Paracelsian medicine to uh, modern medicine? Now, also, you mentioned uh, a very interesting thesis that the reason why we have this Jewish Christian medical cooperation is because of the high mortality rate. In other words, everyone faced this uh, terrible situation where. Uh, People got sick, where there were epidemics, where there were lots of death at an early age. And so <coughs> there was no choice but to work together. Well, it's an interesting hypothesis. Do you have anything to back it up? Do you have any kind of evidence for it? Because that I didn't see in the paper. Do you like this or do you do not? I do. <laughs> yeah, yes, I like it. <laughs> not to point whether I like it or not. I'd like to know what you think. I want to know what. what uh, and finally, the last sentence, where you also a very uh, stimulating suggestion that uh, enlightenment aimed to integrate Jews socially while it marginalized them intellectually. That sounds good, but when you think about it, it wasn't one of the objectives of enlightenment to educate Jews, dafka to educate them. That, uh, the idea was we're going to we're going to integrate the Jews by educating them. So uh, how does that square with marginalizing them intellectually? So those are my questions. And, uh, okay, thank you very much, Mitchell. Thanks. Uh, let me very briefly answer your question, starting from the last one. The last one is the uh, uh, polemical, is, is a debate between, uh, between Dom and, and Mendelssohn. Dom says, well, we are ready to integrate Jews, but first we have to reform them, to, to regenerate them. And Mendelssohn says, integrate them, and then we'll see there is nothing bad about them. They can be just part of the society as <coughs> is. So this is an ongoing discussion of the two models, um, uh, two approaches to who Jews are vis-a-vis -vis the general society in the enlightened thought starting from the 1780s and onward. 
And I would not go into that because it's it's a very big debate. It's it's between Dom and Michael. It's between Dom and Mendelssohn. It's between um, um, uh, French and uh, 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 German Jewish um, enlightened uh, thinkers. And it's about two models uh, that you would see in Europe. You can actually see the entirety of Europe. Um, uh, taking either this or that model of Jewish integration. Nicholas I says, let's first uh, reform Jews or uh, regenerate them, um, and then we'll see whether we integrate okay, them or not. That's the standard description that you're giving them, but I think with that sentence you were pointing at something else. There's a Hiddush here. Yeah, there is a Hiddush there, okay, I, I do believe. That has nothing to do with what you're talking but, about. But let, let, let me get to that. That's what I want to get. I okay, and my my theory is very simple. I'm saying, enlight, enlightenment uh, marginalizes Jews intellectually by putting them down. Enlightenment actually by saying, you know, folks, we will integrate you socially, but we first have to acknowledge that intellectually you are not fit in this particular society. So it really Jews them down. Excuse me for the language, and says, okay, you are there, but we will educate you. So we are coming as you know. Uh, uh, intellectual guardians. We, 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 would, we understand that you are out there, you know, very low, but we will, we will uplift you. It's, it's a very kind of a condescending approach of enlightened thinkers to the Jews that have not yet been discussed in, 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 in uh, uh, the uh, books that look at different models um, of attitudes and different relations between the non-Jewish thinkers of, of enlightenment and the Jews. <laughs> And that's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that, that exactly because enlightened and, uh, uh, thinkers um, disregard or scorn uh, this fusion culture or this, this particular, uh, in, in my case, um, uh, hy uh, hybridic culture, they simply put them down. They say, yes, we'll bring to you the education, but this education has nothing to do with the hybrid culture that the Jews um, um, are sharing with, with the non-Jewish population at that particular time. I'm, I'm ready to discuss that, but it it's, it's really brings us to, to, to a very big, it's, it's, it's a kind of worms, Moshe, and, and uh, I, I'll, you open it, I'm ready to eat it. But somebody has to share with me <laughs> this particular. Now, let, let, let me go to other questions. Um, uh, transition model. I believe I'm showing that um, there are different levels of transition. At a certain professional level, the establishment of the Polish um, uh, Academy of Medical, uh, uh, Polish Academy of, of, of uh, uh, Medicine in, um, in, the, in the 1750s, it, it professionalizes uh, the, uh, the field. Uh, the establishment of the um, School for Felchers uh, for Paramedics by Peter the Great in, in the 1720s, it professionalizes the field. I'm not saying this professionalization immediately changes the picture, but I'm showing that there are different stages, there are different steps leading to the uh, reassessment and re-evaluation of who Baal, the Baal Hashem are in this, in, 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 in later in the, in the um, 18th century, and certainly in, in the uh, early 19th century. Maybe you are right, I have to be more precise talking about this transition. Um, now, Baal Shem Tov competing with doctors, not competing with doctors, um, in the uh, book published in 1814 and 1815, and Hillel Baal Shem learning, studying f with or from doctors um, in the 1720s, 1730s. Um, that is an interesting point, and, and I believe um, I would say this again, following your models of uh, discussion uh, or, or your approach to to Shifhei Habesht. The more I think about it, uh, the more I yeah. doubt uh, that uh, the, these particular texts, there are three or four texts where Baal, the Baal Shem Tov meets with the doctors, um, really reflect uh, the agendas of the, of the 1740s. I think these are the texts that reflect the agendas of the 1820s. And uh, then we have to, I have to, to I just have to take this paragraph out of the text. Zeloshayak, meaning that it talks about a very different era and very different context. So the book of Habesh talks more about the contemporary context of the 1820s and the way the Baalei Shem or the Tzedikim looked at the doctors at that particular time and does not convey any kind of meaning or feeling that is characteristic of the 1720s, 1730s. Um, and finally, a question about uh, 
Jewish pharmacist. Yes, I do deal with, with this uh, apteka, uh, all the, uh, last name all the time. There are many of them. It's not, not the only uh, Daniel or um, the rabbi who you mentioned in the Jewish. Uh, th th there are others who have this last name. Well, these are maybe uh, uh, well-versed in uh, yetrochemistry Jews who are hired by the owner or by the leaseholder of the local pharmacy, and Jews call him Aptekash because he works in the pharmacy, but he is not necessarily the uh, owner or uh, the uh, leaseholder of the pharmacy. Um, this is this is an open question. I'm not saying Balaban is wrong, I'm right. I'm not saying Balaban is right, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not saying this. I'm saying th this is the question to explore more, and I have to dig deep into the archival documents to find out what's going on. What uh, amazes me is that in the 17th century, uh, they adopt the laws in Poznan, and these laws are uh, taken elsewhere into the central Poland, so it's, it's, it's something going from Poznan eastward. The idea that Jews are forbidden to be uh, uh, to be the pharmacist. It's a law, it's, it's in the, in, in the, in the um, statute uh, published by the city hall and distributed uh, from elsewhere. When, from when is it is already in, 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 in the mid 17th century in Poznan. Just in Poznan. Just in Poznan, but, uh, but I do see uh, that they are transferring this prohibition elsewhere. And the, the reason for this is very oh, simple. But you also have, uh, uh, the non -tolerance I, under this, I understand. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's true. That but but there, are, that there aren't hundreds of shtetls. Or, the, but or do have, towns, do have right. towns where you have Jewish farmers? I do agree with that. But I'm going through inventage. I'm going through the inventories of the towns. And I do not see there uh, Jewish owners of the, or leaseholders of the farmers. It's just not there. And, and that amazes me. So I ask my, look, uh, I looked at dozens of this uh, of this uh, inventories. It's it's not about uh, Nyasvish or Troyanov um, or Zhokov or or or, or, Zamos or or other towns in this particular area or Olika or Ostrog. You have found dozens of them. Pardon? You have found dozens of. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not saying thousands. I'm saying dozens. Dozens. Yes. Dozens. Yes. Dozens. yes, yes. There are there are many. They are not necessarily of the same era. Uh, of of the same era. There might be something, for instance. Um, Jolkiv would, Jolkiv would have. I have other things to do in my life. Uh, excuse me. I need to write a book about Stalin. I uh, right. uh, after the book about Lenin. Um, uh, look, uh, this inventory, this inventories uh, exist, for instance, for that particular town in 1695, and for this particular town in 1751, and for that particular town for 1717. There is nothing that would allow you to, to, to compare uh, the inventory um, of one particular town through years. Sometimes you have that, for instance, in, 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 in Zhokov, but also for a very brief time, then for, for, the, for the period of time when I'm most interested in it, let's say 1707, 1725, there is nothing. After 1725, there is another uh, uh, bunch of, of, of inventories of, of, uh, of Zhokov. However, what I, what I see there is quite enough for me to make uh, to make my. Uh, well, but there are places where you have a run of, in, of inventage for. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is that I do case. not see there the 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 name of a Jew with the with the word uh, the owner of the pharmacy or the leaseholder of the pharmacy there. You know, that 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 is that is my point. So I do not see the evidence. I would like to make a claim. I do not see this evidence. But I do know that there are. Jews who are called Aptekash. The so question what it means is a different one. One other issue I forgot uh, to raise before, and that's the linguistic issue. Uh, what are the languages involved here in this cultural exchange? Uh, may I ask you to please uh, put down the... Uh, the gut, well, we can see it. Okay, it's, it's, it's not really th that well seen. Oh. Let's do it. Just one second and I'll show you a couple of interesting things. Okay, no, it's fine. Um, before we look at, at this, uh, at this text, I would like to, to mention that, that I'm right now working on uh, two as two strictly linguistic aspects of the uh, uh, of the Sifrei Sigulot and and of the manuscripts that I have um, uh, between uh, the time when the article was. Uh, uh, sent to to to, uh, to print and and now I got three new 
uh, interesting Kabbalistic manuscripts from East Europe. Uh, one uh, Gershon Greenberg gave me, somebody gave him a Kabbalistic manuscript, another I got from Amsterdam, also East European, Sefer HaKeshek, uh, 15 pages, and all of them have the same kind of uh, um, interplay, linguistic interplay um, between uh, Hebrew and Slavic languages. When I say Slavic languages, I would want to name this, these languages or to name this language. I cannot do that, as you will see in a second. Uh, I'll explain why I cannot talk about you know, Judeo, Russian or Judeo, Polish or Judeo, Belarusian, Judeo, Ukrainian interaction. It's, more, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, so I'm studying right now uh, this incorporation of the Slavic elements um, into Hebrew texts and uh, uh, incantations, mostly in Slavic languages, um, in uh, Hebrew letters that appear in these manuscripts and in these books. Um, uh, so we are talking about Sifrei uh, Segulot uh, that, that are written mostly in Hebrew with the incorporation of Slavic incantations, with the incorporation of all sorts of uh, uh, paramedical words and notions that come from Latin, German, uh, and, and other languages, uh, including Slavic languages, and also uh, they incorporate Yiddish. A lot of uh, Yiddish, for example, it's, it's amazing when, the, uh, uh, when, when Hillel Baal Bal Shem talks to, uh, to doctors, or, or re remembers the doctors, or remembers his teachers, from who he uh, studied uh, or took uh, the medical, uh, the, the Kabbalistic manuscripts, he uh, talks in Hebrew. Uh, when he uh, talks about uh, the way to uh, um, treat a, a woman uh, with an incantation, he uses Slavic um, uh, incantations. Uh, but when he talks to D-books, to the D-books, the demons, he talks in Yiddish. Uh, and I have uh, an interesting theory why does it happen, so I'm studying the Yiddish ingredients in, uh, in these books and manuscripts. Let's talk about uh, this linguistic aspect that, 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 that Moshe uh, asked me to talk about. Um, this is taken from anon the anonymous 18th century manuscript from Smilonichi, Belarusia. Um, uh, we do not have this manuscript, but excerpts uh, appeared in the article published by the great um, Belarusian writer Zmitrov Biadula, uh, who is known as Shmuel Plavnik, and who certainly knows uh, Hebrew because he started in the early 1900s with a bunch of uh, books uh, of his Hebrew poetry, then switched to Belarusian. Um, tell me what kind of language uh, we are looking at. Again, it's, 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 in, it's written in Hebrew letters. Prishlas Shuda Dotago Ploni Tsi at Khvarobe at Palachni Tsi at Paddimani. You have it in Hebrew letters? Yes, I have it in Hebrew letters. Uh, but you can show us? I mean, we would like to see if, if it's possible. Uh, Okay, I don't have it on me, but I, I can bring it, certainly. Uh it parivanya chiot charivanya zakazuya ya tebi boskim imyam um shot nebo izimya istvarel taktina mestsi pashla uh gizitibi pan bog istvaril um da pupani da glave ni da sierzo ni da boku ni dihu i vstupai z dih mestse gedzitebi na leje bojim imyam omen na vek. Wow. This is my tentative translation. I have come here to this Plony because of his disease or because he's bewitched. I order you by the name of God who created heaven and earth, return to your place where Lord God created you. Do not go to the navel, to the head, to the heart, to the side, to the lungs. Um, get out from the places where you are not supposed to stay by the name of God, a man forever. Okay, you have here elements of Belarusian, elements of Ukrainian, uh, certainly elements of Polish. Let's look at this. Uh, Hillel Baal Shem Sefer uh, has uh, a number of these incantations. Podi sebe z tego ploni ben ploni od wszystkich dwieso sterdzesti i osim člonkich imenem boškim, który stworil niebo i ziemlu, będzie mi na dopomoce, jak ów deň, tak i w noce, i wazywają, i wyklikają, zaklinają imenem boškim, który stworil niebo i ziemlu, będzie mi na dopomoce tego ploni ben ploni retuvac. Żeby Boże żywy, w tebe szczere serce służył, ja plonie ben plonie imieniem Bożkim um, odsyłają za czarnym morem, za e, trestenicy, tam i znajdziesz czarną czarnicę, tam rozciągajesz się i tam krew wypiewaje, a tomu plonie ben plonie pokidaj na wieki. Well, it's Polish, it's Belarusian, it's elements of, it also has elements of Ukrainian. What are you speaking? Are you speaking of literary languages or are you speaking of dialects, first of all? 
Second, your first text was your Russian dialect, absolutely clear. Second okay. text, it's Polish, with maybe some elements of uh, Eastern Slavic. Uh, well, I do see speak, here. You have to have in mind that at that time people didn't write in literary languages, but in dialects. Of course, of and course. the first no text is dialect, your Russian dialect. This is also, uh, this is very, very close to Polish, for sure. Right, but it has, ele it has words well, and expressions moreover, that are moreover, def definitely not Moreover, Moreover, that you vocalize it from, from a Hebrew, so to exactly, say. No, right, that's right. why we need to see yeah, the Hebrew. Yeah. So the, the, the problem no is question that uh, it, 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 it's dialect, and uh, in your text also you ascribe some passage to Ukrainian and Hebrew. It wasn't Ukrainian, it was Belarusian. Then okay. you have to know, uh, I mean, remember, that between the Russian and Ukrainian, there is a big, big, so to say, transitory, sa transitory, transitory area of Polishian uh, dial uh, dialects, and which doesn't belong exactly neither to Ukrainian nor no, to Belarusian. Right, 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 right. What I'm trying to say is that certainly so, when I'm vocalizing the text, I have to, to put it down in order to vocalize but it. But linguistically, it's easy to more or less. Right. Say. I, I do agree that that uh, uh, we are talking about uh, dialects here, but. Uh, Dialects of what languages? Different dialects of, Sla of Eastern Slavic languages with elements. I'm not saying it's in Polish. I'm not saying it's in Ukrainian. I'm not saying it's Belarusian. This, saying is, this is Polish for sure. Uh, well, not everything here is, is Polish. Not everything, but there is Kresy. There is this, you know, element of Kresy. Janzyk Kresowy. Right, but when we talk about Janzyk Kresowy uh, or the, the, the borderland language, it's bo this borderland language is already not 100% not Polish, so I would be <laughs> reluctant to say... But there isn't such a thing as, as, as pure language. There isn't such a thing. Every right. language that's exactly English. what I'm saying. That's, exa that's exactly but what I'm saying. But you can ascribe more or less uh, this, uh, this, whatever, this phenomenon to Polish, and the previous one to Belarusian, for sure, more or less. Um, I'm, as I'm, for, I'd you say, a big share of East, East, uh, East Slavic languages, there are only two of them. There is either Ukrainian or Belarusian, which are very close to another. Mm -hmm. And then there is a, an element of transitory element, uh, so to say, area of between Polish. Belarusian and uh, Ukrainian. Right, right. I'm, I'm more interested uh, to discuss here what Moshe mentioned, uh, um, as Moshe called, um, uh, hybrid. It's hybrid, it's a cultural hybrid, but it's also linguistic hybrid. And it's okay for a linguistic hybrid to have elements of all these different languages that we today see as different languages. Perhaps for people like Balei Shem who were using these languages, it was absolutely, they were indifferent to linguistic aspects. They, they did not finish Hebrew University, graduate Hebrew University with a diploma in linguistics. You know, they just, uh, they use whatever is available out there at the ground level. That's, that's, that's who they are. Okay, so um, I think it, it also opens up uh, another facet of the discussion of where are they taking this kind of incantations? And uh, are they using this kind of incantations in Hebrew milieu or in, excuse me, in Jewish milieu or, or in, in a non-Jewish milieu? Are they using these incantations to cure non-Jews? If so, what does it mean? If they are using these incantations to cure the Jews, the question is, why are they using this kind of uh, Slavic incantations to cure the Jews? Are Jews, do the Jews understand what kind of things are, to are told them? These are, these are, I can ask you more questions, but these are questions to ponder. This is not something that I'm since ready to was, answer immediately. Is it possible to, to do more with the ethnic belonging of these demons? <laughs> um, that is, by the way, this is this is this is a very important point. Yeah, the this is a very important point. Local demons, Mezikim, yes, Mezikim. it's true. Mezikim. Right, right. Local, Mezikim, local. Uh, Mezikim are all yeah, coming from, 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 their from own the language. Right. I do have somewhere in the article. Of course, <laughs> right. We know that. Right, right. So, so this is this is also something to 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 to, to ponder. And, and again, it, it's it's fascinating to be able to ask these questions. I don't think we'll have answers. Because in, in, in none of the books that, uh, or manuscripts that I worked uh, with, um, uh, they mention who is their clientele. They do not say who is the recipient of this particular uh, of this particular incantation. They do not tell you, I am using this uh, on, a, on a Jewess, or I am using it on, on a Gentile lady. And I think um, not saying that gives us a number of options, at least two. One of the options is they're using this with 
on a Gentile woman, because a Gentile woman would understand what he's talking about. They may use it on a non-Jewish, on a, on a Jewish woman, because in that particular case, a Jewish woman would, would, would feel that she, as a Jewess, is really an integral, healthy human being, but there is this goyish kind of, of, of malady which is sitting there. That's why it has to be treated through the goyish linguistic um, um, amulets. Does a plony ben plony automatically mean a Jew? It's not a... I believe I believe um, um, he is simply not well first he doesn't know uh, what will be uh, <coughs> the non-Jewish uh, even of Petrov Sidorov what will be <laughs> the non-Jewish way to say plony ben plony uh, so for, 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 for the Baal Shem it's important to say plony ben plony meaning that anybody uh, with the with the name of, of, of the father it can be Piotr Ivanovich, it can be uh, Simon Vasilievich, it can be anybody. But 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 what what, uh, what amazes me sometimes he says plonit ben ploni, sometimes he says ploni ben plonit. So it's not necessarily that he is using um, uh, the mother's name when he cures. So he's this is this not consistent. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Maybe you can use Polish elements. We have much of that. You know, Polish doctors. So writes that uh, Polish women, Polish men, goes to this by shame, to Jewish doctors and so on. For example, yeah. I mentioned Stashkovsky in the article very briefly. Right. He has a whole book dedicated to Jewish uh, doctors. Yes, uh, yes, in the body of the Torah Right. So, uh, and it gives m much information about this. So you can... Right, I'm bringing in the article examples of the of the Jewish doctors and Jewish remedies that are used by Polish doctors. So I found a number of manuscripts in in, in Krakow in in, uh, in Czartoryski Library. Uh, somebody is making uh, uh, for himself or herself just lists of, of remedies and and mentions uh, uh, en passant that I got this kind of remedy from a Jewish doctor who used this remedy on on a girl who had. Uh, uh, who had a, uh, uh, some sort of, of, of uh, a uh, uh, you know walking dysfunction? So there are references in uh, uh, in this uh, anonymous manuscripts, not even manuscripts, you know, pieces of paper, where the poles refer to the uh, uh, Jewish doctors and to the Jewish know-how. If there is such a thing as Jewish or Polish know-how. I have a question about your methodology. Okay. Uh, you kind of offer us this uh, sort of dialogical model, you know, that's kind of two cultures, you know, interact with each, uh, with each other. And my question is, what we know about influence of these uh, manuals, of uh, Balsham Tom ma manuals, on uh, uh, German or Polish uh, doctors, you know? Because it looks like uh, those manuals, you know, we, we have kind of two cultures. Yes, we have two cultures. But we have one culture is esoteric culture, another is exoteric culture, which progressively become exoteric, as you demonstrated, you know, it was some of the things were written in Latin, then they become written in Polish, yes, so it was yes. kind of widely available. Uh, from another side, we have a culture that uh, practice medicine in a framework of Kabbalah. And Kabbalah, by definition, is esoteric sort of doctrine, you know, which uh, uh, this framework, you know, imposes even more restrictions, you know. Another restriction is the uh, language, you know, that we have uh, this manuals written in Hebrew. What do we know, you know, how this particular literary, of course, you know, it can be on a personal level, as you said, you know, maybe some doctors who were, were Jewish, you know, and they somehow interacted with, uh, with the people. But again, you know, on a literary level, I don't see the equal volume, you know, of those cultures, you know, and kind of like uh, this interaction, it looks like it may be some interaction, but from one side we have uh, great influences, you know, as you demonstrated. From another side, we don't have substantial, uh, uh, substantial influences because of, again, esoteric nature, you know, of the manuals and, uh, and the ways how it was practiced. Thank you. Thank you. It's, 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 it's a question. But let me, uh, let me start uh, by saying this. Um, you suggest the literary context. You suggested comparing books that are in Hebrew and by definition... Well, you're doing this too, you know. Uh, hold, hold, hold on a second, hold on a second. What I'm doing is also questionable. Uh, you suggested to look at the um, Hebrew books that are certainly not being read by Polish doctors and Polish books that are most likely read by Polish doctors. 
uh, by, by, by a Jewish Baalei Shem. So you're suggesting this. You're saying, Yochanan, you're dismissing this dialogue model. You're saying there is no model of borrowing uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, influencing. Um, but it is not really so, you are saying, because if you look at literary aspects of your problem, you will see certainly that Jews are taking from Poles, but Poles cannot take from Jews because they do not read, uh, do not read Hebrew. It's an interesting point, but I believe you are missing something very important. These people, Polish doctors, uh, Polish paramedics, uh, Polish Jewish, whoever they are, uh, pharmacists, and Baal Shem operate in a predominantly oral society. The books are just, uh, it's vademekum, it's what, what, what I bring with me, just in the case there will be a kahal or, or a, 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 a uh, a poor it's called it's, 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 it's not only a language. Hold it's, hold also, hold. it's also the how it practiced because it's practiced inside of the Kabbalah. We don't have this manual. Hold on a second, I, I will, I will talk okay. about it. That's I'm going exactly in this direction. Okay. So uh, this Baal Shem, Hillel Baal Shem, has the manuscript uh, on him and uh, he may come to a Kahal and uh, the Kahal would say, okay, we are announcing a tenure track position for a practical Kabbalist and uh, uh, they would accept him and he would stay there and if he is successful, he would get uh, his tenure as, as the Baal Shem Tov got in the town of Mejibosh and, and hold it for 20, 20 years, you know, and Dao chair in practical Kabbalah. That's why they have manuscripts. In all other cases, they do not need manuscripts, they do not need books. The, you're taking a literary aspect of it which is a very, very minor aspect of all of this process, of all of this phenomena. It gives us a window onto what is going on. But we should remember that these documents have their own very minor place in this huge system um, uh, or phenomenon of, of practical medicine. Why so? Because it's a predominantly oral society. And in this oral society, we do see that Poles take know-how from Jews, and Jews take know-how from Jews. Know Can you from demonstrate Jews. it on some Polish uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, I did that. Uh, manuals, you know, how some knowledge, let's say, from these Balsham, Balsham manuals were some. I'm how. quoting the book in the article. I'm quoting a number of manuscripts and books in the article. It's just there. And I just and I took only the tip of the iceberg. I will ho I will have to go to, uh, I will have to look at, at uh, Polish manuscripts. Well, I, I actually looked at, at several dozen of Polish medical manuscripts of 17th, early 18th century, um, um, and uh, I saw that that they do use many Kabbalistic things there. You For what purpose? Give us one example of a, a Hebrew incantation there in your text. Right. Do you have uh, many more examples in? Uh, Polish texts or in Slavic texts of using all these kind of formulas and incantations in Hebrew or with Hebrew elements? Yes, yes. Clavicola uh, uh, Solomonis, uh, this uh, famous uh, Latin book translated into German, into Polish, is perhaps the most popular book. It's what, what Moshe called the, the kitchen book of, of uh, uh, Christian Kabbalah, uh, of, which, is, which is widely used, it's widely copied. Um, I saw, for instance, at least 10 or maybe 15 copies of the book, which is published already many, many times, and still people copy it by hand. In, in Polish archives, you find this uh, Latin and Polish versions of Clavicula Solomonis, and this Clavicula Solomonis has dozens of incantations in, 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 in Hebrew. It's a twisted Hebrew, it's, it's again, it's, it's, a, it's a fusion Hebrew, it's, it's a, a hybridic Hebrew, Hebrew with some Latin, with, you, you don't know really how to, to, to read it, but, but yes, they are using these incantations, and pieces of clavicular Solomonius texts are incorporated in the books of Polish doctors. But original Slavic texts, I mean written in Polish, or written in Ukrainian, or written in Belarusian, which have in it some kind of... Of, of Hebrew incantations. Right. Uh, uh, I, am, I, am, uh, I know where this material is. I'm planning to use it. Uh, um, I will have a chapter in the book um, on the linguistic skills and linguistic aspects of Sifrei Sigulot and Sifrei Kabbalah Masit, and and there I will use these particular incantations, uh, Belarusian incantations written in, in Hebrew letters or uh, things written in Belarusian, uh, transcribed in Belarusian, but actually Hebrew text. I, I I will use this kind of thing. The only problem with that is, um, and again, I do not have methodology. Maybe Moshe will will, will have. Uh, 
will, will help me to, to, to find out how to mythologically discuss it. You know, I am trying to limit myself radically in, uh, in terms of my time frame. I'm saying, Yohanan, you do the, 17, uh, the 1690s, the 1750s. If you do not know how to date the manuscript of the text, don't use it. Fair, fair. Okay? Fair. So I, I might be dealing with a 16th century text. The question is, can I glue it to my uh, early 18th century material? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, but but if, if I cannot answer this question, I prefer not to use this material. So okay. that, that is my problem with, especially with folklore material. We do have, Moshe uh, Altbauer uh, uh, published these things, and, and, and uh, Moshe Taubu works on, on these kind of things, and, and there are materials there in the Minsk archive and in the, uh, the Vernadsky Library. For instance, the Vernadsky Library has a number of, um, of uh, notebooks that I mentioned to Moshe, uh, uh, to Professor Taubu, um, that, uh, that have exactly these kind of things. So, Belarusian, uh, Incantations. There's incantations in, in, uh, uh, written by a Belarusian scribe, but these are Hebrew incantations. Okay, they have several notebooks of those. The provenance of these notebooks is, is absolutely unknown to me. I don't know where they're coming from to the library, who owned them, who is the, the, the copyist, when they were uh, copied, uh, for what purpose, they are t where they are taken from, taken from, what are their sources, and what actually is the epoch to which they uh, factually belong. Can I use this kind of things? No. I can probably use them in, in my footnote saying, well, we do have this kind of material which is a parallel, but I cannot use it, cannot use it uh, as, as, as a blueprint for anything because I cannot date it. Uh, may I ask you, were there any religious prohibitions on either the Christian or Jewish side on using amulets and incantations that come from the alien? religion and how, was, was the attitude of the healers of, uh, I'll do whatever works, you know, this may be of goyish or learning, but if it does the job, right. you know, okay. okay. Um, I had to go, um, um, well, this coming Sunday, to a conference in, in, uh, in Padua, uh, organized by uh, Richard Kieckhafer from Northwestern. He is the, 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 the he is a medievalist working on possession cases. Um, uh, Diane Elliott, also Northwestern um, uh, medievalist. Uh, a number of, of Italian scholars. The conference was about um, the breaking of the legal, religious legal uh, boundaries. Uh, by uh, uh, early modern Europeans. And I was planning to, um, to discuss just that, um, how the Baalei Shem are crossing the, or transcending, or even violating religious boundaries um, in their uh, amulets. And, and I'll give you one example that, that will immediately ring the bell. And this example I found in, um, uh, in, in East, among East European Ballet Sham and among the Italian Ballet Sham and among the German Ballet Sham. They say, um, if you um, have a teshuka, if you have, if you have a, this passion uh, for this particular girl and uh, she doesn't like you, um, um, Get a piece of of of, of, of dough. Uh, take a drop of your sperm, put your sperm in this dough, and make a cake out of it, and give her to eat this cake, and she will be yours. Okay. Look, you are eating too much. Do you do understand that man? What what are you what are you trying to do? And and I, are you prescribing this kind of amulets? Okay. Another another example. Um, if a person has a fever. Um, uh, go to the local market, um, buy uh, a buy carp, um, take the carp and boil it intensively and, and for, for, for two hours, for, for example, in the urine of the person who is sick and who has a fever. But don't tell him that and then give him the carp <laughs> to eat. Okay? So, 
you read these kind of things all the time. They're using most amazing things. I haven't seen the usage, by the way. I have never seen the ritual usage of the menstrual uh, blood. Never. But semen, uh, uh, sweat, um, uh, bones of the deceased people, uh, things that, that have, to, you know, that, that are called avot uh, letuma. Uh, these kind of things you see all the time used by Baalei Sham uh, for the healing purpose. Can I say something? Yes, please. So, the answer to your question, I think, was a little different about amulets, but what Yochan was talking about is that kashrut is out the window. You know, right. You're eating frogs and uh, mouse turds and all. But that really starts in the Talmud. Uh, the Talmud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use it from a lucky point of view if it's for medical purposes. Well, that's the Talmud. It says if, you, if, it's it's Israel. if something works three times, then you can use it. Right. Yeah. And also Shabbat. Uh, there's a lot of things that Yom Baal Shem tells you to do uh, involve violating Shabbat because you have to smoke on Shabbat. So right, inhale, inhaling, inhaling thing. You say inhaling in English? Yeah. Yes, but you have, to, you have to make the smoke. Right, so right, right. right. Inhale. And by the way, drinking urine uh, was a common, med uh, common medicine practice and probably is scientifically justified. It was prescribed by doctors. Urine? Urine, urine. Right, urine. right, right, right. Drinking your own urine is not magic. It's, you have uh, it, it helps. It helps. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, it, it works. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what about the Tao? It works too? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried it. I mean, there's also voodoo in. Uh, <laughs> right. T t tell the story, Moshe, please. You, you, you found it. Um, he has Hillel uh, Shem in Sefer HaKashi. He has voodoo, voodoo, plain and simple. He says, if you have somebody who's your enemy and you want to harm them, so take a doll and take a piece of wax, make it into a doll, and then put pins in wherever. It's got a whole description. It's just, it's just mm. Isn't it also rather common? Butuka umenuse. No, it's not something unheard of. Right. Can I answer the question? He's acupuncture points and he feels better because he does it. Okay, do we have other questions? Okay. Okay, Moshe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.